Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker today, Deborah Santiago. She is the co-founder, chief operating officer, and vice president for policy at Excelencia in Education. For more than 20 years, she has led research and policy efforts from the community to national to federal levels in order to improve educational opportunities and success for all students alike. She co-founded Excelencia in Education as a way to inform policy and practice and to accelerate Latino student success within higher education. In addition to her numerous uh, pub publications, her current work uh, presently focuses on student success in higher education, um, federal and state policy, financial aid, and Hispanic serving institutions. Without any further ado, please help me give a warm welcome to Deborah Santiago. So I have to come over here since those of you who came early saw me topple that entire desk over. Uh, I'm afraid if I get animated, then I might do it again. So, uh, and it's on, it's on wheels, so it wasn't completely my fault, uh, my zeal, but um, if you don't mind, and I'm short, so I like to stand so people can see me. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me here. Thank you for the Bill Pre Center in Beverly specifically for inviting me. You know, as I was thinking about um, what I might share with you, I, uh, you know, you always start doing your homework. Know your audience a little bit is what I try to do. I can't claim to know all of you, but uh, maybe take a step and look at the Bill Pre Center and what it had as its mission. And it made me think about the mission of excellence in education, how they kind of link. So uh, I saw it says, prepare leaders and teachers for careers in community colleges. Pretty succinct, pretty clear, that's pretty good. Um, and the approach is, you know, quality instruction, research to inform diversity and develop each student. Also, simple, powerful uh, approach and mission to serve. And I thought about uh, Excelencia, and you heard a little bit there uh, about us. Our mission is to accelerate Latino student success in higher ed. Um, and uh, for us, that is summarily significant. Um, and I think it ties to what I, I'm going to link it to what I see as a Bill Priest Center as well, because I want to have this conversation about Latinos and community colleges, and, and hopefully it'll lead to a conversation with all of you. Our approach to that is uh, similar. I, I tend to call it ignorance abatement, you know, because I'm in D.C. and you've got to make things sound sexy if you're going to get them anywhere, right? In part because uh, I think this correlates a lot to the idea of you know, having research to inform and develop into students, having quality. Um, ignorance, you could do something about, you can educate, and all of us are in the business of educating people. If you're ignorant, that means you don't know. People think they know more than they do. Now, stupidity, you can't do much about, you can't really educate past that, but ignorance, you can do something about. And part of the charge that I have in creating the organization, having 50 titles, um, is to do this ignorance abatement. Because, you know, I, I was in DC for quite a while, the US Department of Education and other places. And uh, rarely when we'd be talking about public policy, would I hear people talk about who the students were. It was this amorphous other, those students. And increasingly I thought, you know, those students are uh, not the traditional students. Increasingly those students look more like me. Increasingly, they are choosing different pathways. And yet in public policy, we're presuming and we're focused on always that traditional student, right? That 18-year-old straight, goes straight from high school to college, lives on campus, and finishes in four years. And that's a wonderful uh, trajectory. I went to college in a traditional manner, even though I was first-gen um, low-income student. So I don't want to denigrate that. But the reality is that's less than 20% of our students today. And trying to find ways to get those in public policy to pay attention to the changing uh, profile of our students overall require that we do something other than uh, continually just try to bring in the numbers, although I am a data nerd and I embrace that. We chose to focus on Latino students because we do think it's a way to pay, get people to pay attention, right? Um, too often in conversations, Latinos are the footnote or the aside after the fact. And we wanted to start with this population to then see if we could address issues that seem intractable in higher education 
in different ways. And that's not to the exclusion of other students, but we kept finding that in this amorphous idea that we're educating all, we neglect to focus that they are individuals that have strengths and needs that, also, that are part of the all. And that the all is kind of an amorphous, and if it's an excuse to not focus on any strengths or needs of any student because we're just serving all, then it's disingenuine in what we need to do. And I would say if we were truly serving all, which I believe is a strong and appropriate metric overall, but if we were truly doing it, we wouldn't see achievement gaps. We wouldn't see choice gaps. It's disingenuine to say we're educating all if we see any gaps at all, because uh, to presume that doing the same by every student means we're serving them all right misses the mark of what we truly are doing as educators. And that kind of, uh, you know, fire in my gut to say, look, you know, it doesn't mean don't serve other people. It means making sure you're intentionally serving Latinos is what inspired us to do something and create an organization called Excelencia in Education, right? Intentionally bilingual. It's a great cognate, Excelencia. You don't have to speak Spanish to know what it means, right? I think all of you know what it means, right? But it sends a message that we hope is inclusive and intentional and in focusing on who we're serving. And I always say it's not to the exclusion of others, but we have found that the inverse isn't necessarily true. Because if we were serving all, we wouldn't see these issues. So what if we started by looking at this population, say, with a Latino lens, what's happening? Does this impact still hold when we look at a subgroup of the whole? If it doesn't, there's an area to target our limited resources or our strategies or efforts. Are there nuances of what we know works that have an adverse or uh, doublingly positive impact on this population? So uh, I appreciate that you know, paying attention to the who we're serving is really important. And I got that sense in looking at the Bill Priest Center with the mission, you're preparing leaders and teachers for careers at community college. To me, it led to another point of consideration, and that is that you know you all know who work in community colleges. Community colleges are seen very much from a deficit perspective. It's where you go when you can't get into a four-year, right? Or it's where you go when you can't afford anything else. In the same way, you know, uh, we work with institutions who might be serving Latino students, but they don't want to claim that because serving a concentrated mass of Latino students presumes you know we're seen from a deficit perspective. Still in 2015, you know, uh, the majority of people I talk to in Washington, D.C. have this profile that Latinos are uh, English language learners, high school dropouts, and recent immigrants, undocumented recent immigrants. Do you not, guys not hear that? I mean, I do anytime you look at it, right? And yet that's, the data belie that. Some of us are that, probably more than other populations, but the majority of Latinos in this country are U.S. born. The majority speak English. The majority are high school graduates. Now it's lower than some other populations. But imagine if we could talk about this population, just like we talk about community colleges, from an asset base and not a deficit base. We talk about the opportunities of investing in community colleges, the opportunities of investing in Latinos. Does that not flip the script and how we think about community colleges, Latinos, and all the students that we serve? Maybe it's me, but it energizes me to think about how that can be different, how we can pay attention to our efforts. It's kind of this idea, you know, it's like taking the globe, and I use this analogy a lot, you know. You turn that globe upside down, it's still the globe. You haven't changed where everything is, but it's a very different perspective. If you've never done it, I suggest you do it. All of a sudden, South America is on top, right? And then you've got the others. It's still the same thing, but it looks so different. Can we think about issues that seem intractable in different ways by f turning that globe upside down, looking at it from what was previously the footnote, and start with that? And in doing so, hopefully serve all of our students better. But not apologizing for starting with this group and what we're looking at. Because I'll share some data with you, because I did say I'm a data nerd, that give you that perspective, which I hope all of you are aware of. But if not, we'll do a little bit of ignorance abatement here too, right? So to me, there was an alignment in looking at mission and approach of what it's done at the Bill Priest Center, but also with Excellencia. Yeah, and that, that matters to me, because you know, uh, this is what I do day in and day out. And finding and working with people who are actually serving students on the ground, I find energizing. 
You know, I'm in Washington, D.C. Uh, I don't touch students directly. I try to uh, be true to what I hear practitioners are doing. Their realities are very different than the kind of conversations I have in Washington, D.C. And I know that. So it's energizing to talk to people like yourselves who are actually doing it. I learned so much that I always take back with me. My challenge and my commitment is to try and translate that back up to see what's good policy. I believe good policy is informed by good practice, not the other way around, right? You don't create policy and then force it into practice. But that's different. And what you think about what you all are doing, serving your students overall, and Latino students specifically, has the potential to really inform change. And I would say in DC, I have seen a change in how we are talking about community colleges in some circles. And that gives me a lot of hope. And the same way I'm hearing different conversations. When we started Excelencia back in the day, um, people either weren't talking about us or it was very deficit. Now I have ACE reaching out wanting to partner with us. And ACT wants to partner with us. Uh, they all want to subcontract with us, you know, little pennies on the dollar for what they're getting. But still, um, that, that big organizations are talking about Latinos as part of the whole is a different message. And that's an important one to understand. And I, so I appreciate being able to talk about Latinos in community colleges for that reason, if nothing else. So I wrote this big note here to myself. I said, you know, um, who are we serving? And how do we know if we're serving them? And I had a great conversation coming up. I, we were zipping by, and Nadia was driving me through here, about, uh, you know, the difference between enrolling students and serving students. And it's something that I really glom on because I do think uh, the idea of an institution that's open access, as our most community colleges, to say, uh, we just serve, we just enroll whoever comes here and then we give them whatever we can. That's not serving in my mind. And looking at institutions that are doing more, that are taking a look there, they are enrolling them because that's a necessary precursor, right? But they're not just enrolling them. They're retaining them. They're supporting them. They're financing them. And they're graduating them. That, to me, is what it means to serve students. And in this case, and I look at the metrics, are you serving Latino students as part of the whole? How do I know you're serving them? Or are you just waiting to see who shows up, uh, you know, uh, how they perform? You don't know where they are. You don't know if they persist or not. You don't have any kind of commitment beyond getting their uh, tuition and fees and making sure that uh, they at least are getting credits or whatever they need to. That is our challenge, I think, in looking at community college students of today and specifically Latino students because I've seen a good increase in access and that's, I think, some of the good work that's been going on as more people are aware of the importance of making sure, not just crassly, that for enrollment management purposes, they're just more Hispanics, so we need to enroll more Hispanics um, to meet our bottom dollar but that we're doing more than that. We're making sure that the commitment we make as an institution is to retain them and support them to completion. That takes added investment and commitment. And that's the challenge in thinking about Latinos in community colleges. Because I'll tell you, the retention numbers are not great. The transfer numbers are not great. And certainly, the students have a responsibility for parts of that. But I do think, uh, you know, and as I was sharing with our colleagues here, uh, it's not a question of interest or will. One of the things that drives me crazy in DC is people say, we need to change the culture <laughs> of Latinos. And you know, I'm not a violent person, but I can't tell you how many times I just want to <laughs> back slap. Uh, but because it's not a culture issue, right? Uh, we time and time again, public agenda and others review and, and do surveys of parents. The aspiration is there. It's the actualization that's not there. And the institutions have some responsibility in that part of it. Certainly students do, so I'm not negating that. But the institution has a role to play that can be helpful. Are we doing anything other than just enrolling them? That dictates a lot of what will happen to those students and whether they go back to our service areas and are contributing in the manner that benefits us then in turn as a community college. Maybe it's not getting the alumni dollars that our four-year brethren are so invested in but it is feeding back to the service area that makes a difference, the leadership, the citizenry that matters. That's what we have to pay attention to rather than you know, um, the uh, assumed inevitability that as Texas grows, as the nation grows, as the Latino population grows, inevitably 
we will be serving more of them, we'll be enrolling them. And so we don't have to do anything, right? I think that's, um, I lament the passivity of that as we look to what our commitment is to our communities and to our institutions and our, to our students. Okay, I gotta give you some numbers. I kind of sidetracked myself, but you know, I get riled up just as I think about, oh, these are my colleagues in DC. So, when I think about Latinos in community colleges, you know, for me, I often, in DC, I'll talk about Latinos and other post-traditional students. And part of this is I spend a lot of my time trying to reframe conversations to get people past that same tired stuff to think about things in new ways. So, you know, the, the general way we talk about things are you're traditional or you're non-traditional, right? I'm enough of a word uh, junkie, I'm a policy person after all, that say, you know, non-traditional means you're not meeting the norm. It's so deficit-based in my mind. But if you say post-traditional, I mean, we're beyond that. The reality is we're not going to return to that traditional majority anymore. Post-traditional means we've got students who are starting and stopping out and returning. They're swirling. They're going part-time, right? Sometimes they're swirling from four-year to two-year, and two-year to two-year, and two-year to four-year. They might need developmental education, right? They might live at home. Uh, they have these characteristics that are the antithesis of a traditional student. They're working, many of them 35 hours plus, some of them full-time. Are we as institutions paying attention to that? I would say compared to four-year, community college is doing a pretty darn good job. But then comparing us with each other and what's potential, I don't think we're doing enough. So I'm a good numbers person, so depending on what I compare, compare Latinos to themselves versus Latinos versus others, gives me different profiles. Does it, how does that compel me to act? That is our ultimate challenge. I think, to me, that's what re I resonate with the Bill Pre Center was going on. It's not just conducting analysis. It's not doing research. It's research to inform. What we do is we try to apply knowledge to pol policy and practice. And that means I have to set aside my reality, because I'm very traditionally trained, and went in a traditional pathway and say, but I'm not the majority. And I've got to find ways to look at today's reality and see how to make that different in community colleges and other places. So, Latinos in the U.S. I'll start in the U.S. and Texas, and I'll go pretty quickly, and all this is available on our website if you want it, but I want to give you context to get to the action part, right? So, um, second largest racial ethnic group in community colleges. 20%. So 54% of the community college students are white, 20% Latino, 15% African American, 6% Asian. So second largest, not bad, 20%. Okay, close to that at for profits actually as well. Uh, we are more disproportionately in community colleges than others. 46% of Latinos enrolled in post-secondary education are in a community college compared to 31% of white students. So yes, we're, uh, as a percentage of all, see how I changed the end for you on that one, right? Um, because almost half of all Latino students are in community colleges. What happens at community colleges matters to Latinos. And almost half of us are there. And that's nationally, and I've got the numbers for Texas as well. Does anyone know in Texas? Ooh, maybe I won't share it. Maybe I'll give you homework. Say what you gotta figure out there, okay. Um, so again, another just quick snapshot. So s over 60% of Latinos that are in community colleges are in two states. California and Texas. I'll see now after lunch, I get some lively folks. All right, good, good, good. Not a surprise, I suppose, right? Wait till I show you some of the completion information though. Texas looks a lot better than California. That's a sad statement in some ways, but a powerfully positive statement as well. All right, so 62% are in two states. 69% are at HSI community colleges, Hispanic Serving Institution Community Colleges. And if you don't know what that is, I can talk about that later, uh, off the side. 58%, uh, so over 50% need some kind of remediation. These are Latinos in community colleges, right? Not a surprise to most of you, right? But the context matters as we think about who. So you, who are you serving, and what's the action you take given what you know? I can't tell you how often I'll go to institutions and ask, and people won't know what the graduation rate is of Latino students, or what percentage of their population is Latino. If you don't know, how can you serve? And often faculty and others, if you don't see them because you're not teaching the 101 courses, you don't know the changes in your institution and your efforts. So 
So paying attention really does matter. Um, less than 20% of students at community colleges that say they want to transfer actually transfer. It's really low, really low. And these are national numbers. So then some, some degree attainment numbers. Um, and again, this is context for why it matters. Nationally, 22% of Latino adults have earned an associate degree or higher. Does anybody know what it is overall? I remember my overachievers that were yelling at me before. 38%. So 22% of Latino adults, 38% of all adults have an associate degree or higher. In Texas, 16% of Latino adults have an associate degree or higher, have earned, compared to 32% of all adults. Double or half. See how it's asset based? <laughs> Double or half. So 16% of Latino adults in Texas, 32% of all adults in Texas have an associate degree or higher. That's context to then say, if I've got effort and investment and I look at population growth, what does that mean for me? Is this an opportunity or is this a crisis that I want to avoid? Because I'll tell you this, I don't know anyone that invests in crises. People invest in opportunity. And framing this in terms of an opportunity can really make a difference in what you're trying to do in serving your population. All right, so um, here's some more good news. All right, in 10 years, the number of Latinos earning associate degrees increased 75% compared to 44% for African Americans, 39% for Asians, 37% for whites. That's a real big increase. Now we started lower, but, and I'm talking absolute numbers, but what I don't want is this perception that it's just we're, we're doing poorly. We're doing better, we're starting from further behind. We're not gonna have a, question, a conversation about equity, but to me this is the heart of equity, right? We can talk about that later if you want to. See, I'm dropping little hints uh, for your questions to come up. Um, I'll go a little bit more quickly because I think maybe I enjoy all this stuff, but maybe you won't necessarily. But So the top 25 institutions awarding degrees to Latinos at the associate level in 2013. We, we track all these data. Of the top 25, how many were in Texas? Two, seven. Did you read my report? <laughs> Oh, you're just good like that. Okay, good. Um, seven, so the state with the most representation in the top 25 institutions awarding absolute degrees to Latinos in 2013 is Texas, seven. Florida has six in the top 25. Who doesn't? Well, they'd have one there, but that's not it, it's California. California has so many more Latinos than others and they don't rank top 25. So when I look at these numbers and we did a ranking by state absolute numbers and overall, they are top in enrolling Latinos like at the community college level, significantly higher, and don't rank anywhere in top five, um, and only two in top 25 in graduating Latinos at the associate level. So in that sense, if that comparison is Texas is doing better than California, even though California has well, not quite, but almost twice as many Latinos as you all do. It's an interesting, uh, I want to say paradox, but a challenge, because I often hear this comment that, you know, uh, demography is destiny, right? Well, eventually we're all going to have Latinos, and so they're going to graduate and everything will be fine. You don't have to do anything. Well, California is an example. They've got a lot more Latinos than in Texas, and they're not even top ranked. They have to do more than just enroll them. They've got to graduate them. We in Texas have to graduate them, and nationally we have to graduate them as well. That's the promise we made when they rolled in, enrolled in. Um, is it worthwhile just mention quickly who the seven are, or do you guys know already? <laughs> mention just in case. All right, all right, all right. Um, what are my time? Okay, Ooh, I'll get, I'll try to be quicker. El Paso Community College, South Texas College, Houston Community College, Lone Star College System, San Antonio College, San Jacinto, or you guys say Jacinto, don't you? San, San Jacinto College, um, and Tarrant County. <laughs> oh, it's Tarrant County, yay, we made it. Um, <laughs> 19 out of the 25, but you're there. That's something, that's good. Celebrate, see, positive, asset-based. Um, so that's numbers. One quick thing about workforce, because then this is the, then get to the action part, right? So I took a look at institutions awarding degrees to Latinos in health and in STEM. Because it's not, it's about educating our citizens, it's about making sure they're getting where they're going, but it's also workforce, right? And I don't wanna conflate the two, but we know community colleges have multiple missions. 
economic development, right, academic creation, right? all these things. So in health fields, and this is nationally, for 2013, 70, over 75% of degrees awarded to Latinos in the health fields were at the, with the certificate and associate level. 76% of all degrees awarded in a given year were in those levels. I hope you'll ask me about that because the implication there is pretty big. So what are the biggest, fastest growing uh, jobs today, according to BLS? Health, but the biggest occupation is a home health care aid. Not a surprise, baby boomers growing others. Do you know how much they make a year? 19540 So you got it. Um, is that a livable wage? For some, it can be. But they're getting out there, getting certificates, and going back into the workforce. They get the message. It's a workforce need. It's a sustainable wage over time. So, uh, and then we've got another 26% at the associate level. And I'm going to talk about what that means for me from a policy perspective, what we can do. But I want you to keep that in your head. In STEM, 22% of associate degrees to Latinos. Uh, I mean, Latinos represented 20% of in the associate level getting STEM degrees. There's higher at the baccalaureate layer there, but the numbers are so much smaller. So if, you know, they're about 40% getting a certificate and associates in STEM, what kind of job are they getting? And what's the fastest growing areas in our community, in our country? All right. Why does it matter? I think I've been making the case for why I think it matters uh, throughout. See, I didn't just give you a linear presentation, just kind of, eh. uh, But, you know, when I think about Texas, about one out of two of your students in K-12 education today are Latino, right? Does anybody know what the median age of Latinos versus uh, is whites are in Texas? Median age of Latinos is 27. Median age for whites is 41. Now compare that to the data on degree completion. Is it any surprise the majority of your students are first generation college goers if only 22% of adults have a degree? 48% of your K-12 population is Latino. The median age is 27. Okay. The opportunity is there. This is a young population that has the potential to, what we're doing in the educational system now matters. We don't have 12 years to get it right, which is, I think, how many of us approach it in policy, right? Because one good year is all they really need. So we got 12 years to get it right and then graduate from high school. So 48% of your K-12 population is Latino. Median age is that. You've got, how many of you have read the 60% by 2030, your update to closing the gaps? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Do you think you can get there without Latinos, without significantly having a intentional targeted plan that includes Latinos. I can tell you when I looked at closing the gaps and tracked it through 2015, I mean, very bold, but I'm enough of a policy person that says, I can get there, I can invest my resources in, in white and African Americans with numbers which are much smaller and meet two out of three goals and call it a day. Because the numbers for Latinos are so big in Texas, there's no way. That is not the right headed way to approach it, by the way. I'm just saying, as a policy person, that's what people often think. I'll hit two out of three and call it good. It matters in Texas how we address Latinos in community colleges. Steve Murdoch always does this great spiel, ROI, all these things. You know, It's great to hear it from a person like Steve Murdoch. Maybe it's more believable than someone like myself, right? I have a vested self-interest. Well, screw that. What's wrong with having a vested self-interest? <laughs> I mean, he does too. I mean, you know, who's paying his social security, right? One out of two is going to be black or brown. Let's not pretend, right? But, you know, sometimes you can't be a seer in your own land. You got to, you know, pay attention to that kind of thing. But I think we have to step away and back from this worry that we can't call it out. That, you know, people are uncomfortable talking about race, ethnicity, especially if they don't feel like they fit into that. I don't think we should be. I don't, you know, uh, it's not... Uh, Taking away from anyone else to say that you're doing that. We had, a, again, a great conversation in the car, long drive in, right? Saying, what does it matter? You know, we're educating all. It's uncomfortable to talk about Latinos. I don't know, you know. I don't want anybody else to get their feelings hurt. Like, we're not talking about our white students. We're not talking about our African-American students. Why does it have to be an either-or paradigm? To serve Latinos doesn't mean don't serve anybody else. You know, I, I use the analogy, it's like uh, we're the United States of America, we're 50 states, right? When you ask where you're from, you're like, oh, I'm from Texas. Aren't you American? 
Why are you separating, say you're Texan, when aren't you American? Well, saying you're Texan doesn't mean you're not American, does it? It's just a description of who you are. Why is it that you say we're serving Latino students? It means that you're not serving everybody else? No, it means you're being intentional and making sure they're served because historically they haven't been served. Why? Because we see attainment gaps. Hello. Bring it back to the data. And those that you couldn't convince before, you're probably not going to convince. But as what we did when we started Excellency, we said, you know what? If I spend all my time trying to convince people that this is a value, I'm going to miss the opportunity to work with those who are ready to work right now, who believe it's possible and are ready to take on the practice. And maybe by showing it and just doing it, putting your head down, we will see the difference. And those who are disbelievers or naysayers or impediments work around them to show the value added of this. And maybe I won't get all the credit for it, but I'm doing the right thing. And I do think that has to be something that sustains us at times when this is a difficult conversation. And I say that as an or somebody who started an organization called Excellency in Education. Like I just call it right out there, right? <laughs> and for me, you know, I work with people across all kinds of efforts and aisles when we talk about gender, rural versus urban. There are lots of ways to, diff to cut this. But I don't want to apologize for saying, yes, and I mean by race, ethnicity. Are we paying attention? The best stories are able to say, and we have this with the evidence-based practices that Beverly showed. Some of those practices that are all evidence-based, data-driven, will show amongst all being served, Latinos are doing as well as or better than others. That's a powerful story to be able to say there is no gap. That should be the story we want to be able to tell. That's success. Right? There are people who will lament that and say, oh, but then you're not going to give us money. You know what? That's our goal, is to serve all. And to serve all means we're not having gaps. If we see gaps, we need to find ways to address them. I think that's part of it. Okay, so uh, quickly, issues to address. Um, dev ed and college readiness. What are some of the things that we know work in dev ed and college readiness? Well, I don't know if I need to tell this audience. You guys know what works, right? No, you don't know what <laughs> You know what doesn't work. You know what? I think we do know what works. We can't afford it. What works? One-on-one -on -one mentoring from a knowledgeable, caring person. That works. Of course, the caveat is they have to be knowing and caring. <laughs> but unfortunately, we can't afford that at the scale, or we're told we can't afford it at the scale we need to. So everything else is finding ways to have economies of scale, finding a way to get to that point without having that. Those of you that can do it one-on-one, -on -one, and many, I know they're academic advisors and others that are giving their time and effort, thank you, that's a wonderful thing. But at scale, that's a hard thing to do. So dev ed, college readiness, you know, we talk about supplemental instruction. We have evidence that it works. You guys are not surprised, you know that. You've done supplemental instruction, right? Uh, instead of putting them in dev ed alone, providing primers, sometimes people just need that extra, you know, three or four weeks rather than sticking them in a year and a half of, because they didn't prove it. Because I know I went back just to test, because, you know, I'm a nerd, um, to take some of the tests. You ever take the compass test as an adult with all the education we have and try to do well on that? I would be in remediation. I will just own that for what it is. But with a couple of weeks, you know, in some effort primers, it could work. So, I mean, we can't, we don't always have to find the expensive things to do. We can find some of it online. There are strategies and approaches to not give up on our students, especially when they come to our doors thinking they did everything right. They graduated from high school, and then they're told, you're not college ready, you're not college material. Go back to the line or do something else. That's disheartening for first-generation students who think they've done it all right. How do we find a way to address that in a scale that keeps them retains them to graduation. That's summarily important. We've got a lot more in the database, but I, I will say, to me, that's really important. When I showed you the data, you know, over 50% need some kind of remediation. That's a targeted thing. I know who I'm serving. If 50% or more need remediation, I need to fix remediation on my campus. And that doesn't mean do away with it, and therefore I fixed it, which is what we see in a lot of four years by policy and others. But what can I do that's outside the box thinking? Maybe get my best qualified faculty to teach it instead of my lecturers or my part-time students. Maybe that's something if they have the pedagogy. Okay, um, I'm going to have to jump a little bit here because I apologize I'm going on too much. But um, 
I will say this, a big issue for Latino students in addition to Dev Ed, and I, I kind of alluded to it when I said post-traditional, the balancing of education, family, and work. You guys encounter that all the time, right? The powerful story there is that they believe they can have it all. And again, this is not just Latinos, but I'm focusing on them as part of the whole representative of it. If you believe you can support your family, be a part, be engaged, you can work and bring own income, and you can get a quality education all at once, you believe the ultimate American dream, right? What are we doing as institutions to help support that vision, that American dream? Or what are we doing to impede it? Is it up to the student to figure it out? That's often what happens. That's why they stop out, return, uh, swirl, take classes, drop out and don't come back. What are we doing there? So I heard some people who are doing some uh, increasingly parental family involvement. It sounds like, what are we doing in college? Helicopter parents? No, it's not those kinds of parents. Those are not the parents that you're involving. But having them create that environment in their home is primarily important for their student. Um, prior learning assessment. I don't know how many of you are doing prior learning assessment here. Are you doing PLA? Oh, that was a half hand. Okay. Prior learning assessment, if you don't know, you should know about it. We did, did some studies taking a look at that. This is giving you credit for work life experience, testing out of things. And you've got people who are balancing work life family. They're getting a lot of on the job training that doesn't correlate academically unless you test for it and give them credit for it. And it will save the money and do, you should take a look at that. Kale is doing some good work that way. I can follow you up with that. Okay. There are a lot of other things there, but um, I guess the last thing I would say is this one of affordability. Um, it comes, uh, I think too many people think affordability is just tuition and fees. For many community college students, it's not about tuition and fees. For many of them, that's relatively affordable. Um, that's why they made the choice to go to community college as to other places. Sticker price, right? We wrote a piece that showed Latino students make choices based on um, cost, access, and location. Whereas conventional wisdom is often you make uh, college choices based on aid, academic programs, and prestige. So already you've got a variance here in the students that you're serving. Know who you serve. What motivates their college choices? So when you look at affordability, it's often not the cost of tuition and fees. It's the opportunity cost. It's what you, for, what you are foregoing in order to go. It's also the cost of life. And we see this definitely with our males. But how do we address that? Is something like free college, this idea of two years free, is that going to get us the answer? I have many a debate with my contemporaries about things like this. I think if the only answer is we'll cover tuition and fees and that that's going to solve it, I don't think that's going to get us the access and completion that people think they're going to get by making tuition and fees free. Because that's not the only cost for people who are economically disenfranchised and are challenged, very vulnerable economically. It's everything else. It's paying for gas to get to class, right? It's the books. It's the child care. It's all those wraparound things that cost us money. That's the challenge. And that's how we have to think about affordability. And I think in public policy, we're not thinking about that. And that impacts Latino students and others in community colleges. All right. So last thing I'll share here. Um, I had a lot more, but um, I feel like uh, I want to ask questions, you guys to ask me questions, and see if I'm hitting the mark or if I'm totally out of the ballpark here. Um, I want to say this. I want to return to who we're serving. Do you know who you're serving? I did this at Sac State, and I asked them if they knew what their grad rate was. Nobody was there. They were gonna, and I had it here to write, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to tell you. You guys need to go find out. What's your grad rate overall and for Latinos? And I can tell you by lunchtime, the IR office had texted every person in the institution to give them their Latino grad rate and their overall grad rate. It was great. Homework paid off. They were very proud to show it to me. I'm like, yes, you should have known that already. But anyway. Um, does what you know about leading and t creating teachers for community colleges, does it align with who you're serving? Is the Bill Priest Center, is the community college, is the College of Education here, or wherever you are, is it serving that? I gave you a quick profile and said, here are a couple of areas. If I know they need remediation, what am I doing? If I know they're balancing their work-life family issue, what am I doing as a college to address that? Do we know what we're doing? Are we teaching our teachers, our faculty, our leaders, our administrators to pay attention to that? 
I can tell you too often that answer is no. I don't, I'm not uh, speaking of the Bill Priest Center or the College of Education here by saying that. But we're so focused on pedagogy, we don't often think about who the people are. We do a great job at the doctoral level of making sure you know your discipline. And that's as it should be, in a way. But if it's the exclusion of who the students are you're teaching, are you being effective in doing that? Can you hold more than one thought in your head about who you're serving and how that translates? That's a big challenge and that I hope in the curriculum and as you think about your work, as your student population is evolving, you're paying attention to that, you maybe getting ahead of it with whatever that means. That doesn't mean decrease your academic rigor or forego your pedagogy. It means make sure you're paying attention to who you're serving and what that can be. That's different. You know what I mean? That's the nuance. That's a good teacher. That's a good leader. Rather than saying, hey, I did this uh, here in, in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's going to work great in Denton, Texas. Let's do it. It's not authentic. It isn't helpful. And if I don't know who I'm serving, I could be doing a disservice to my students. All right. Here's, here's some advice that I'll, I'll uh, kind of end with. Um, in serving Latinos in community colleges, be intentional. Be intentional in finding what works. Implement it and prove that it's working. But be intentional. I know that's uncomfortable for a lot of people, but if you don't call it out, it's easier for people to hide behind it or to use that as an excuse to not serve. Be intentional. And that doesn't mean be exclusive that be intentional. I have all the data here I didn't share with you, but I pulled, broke it out by all race ethnicities. I only shared Latino because, you know, again, I don't have enough time, but be intentional. Be inclusive of Latinos. I can't tell you, you know, we know things that work. Cohort models work for Latinos. They work for all. They especially work for Latinos. We've seen it. We have the data that prove it time and time again. I can't tell you how many times I go to institutions where I ask, so this really works well. You have a high concentration of Latinos. Are they in your learning community? Are they in your first year experience? I don't know. Well, we know they work for Latinos, but if they're not there, are you help? Is it working? You've got to disaggregate your data and know are they part of the very thing you've put in place to make sure it's working? If not, you've got a little bit more work to do to make sure that they get there so they get the benefit of the services you've worked so hard to put in place. Be intentional, be inclusive. Don't accept excuses, but find solutions. I can't tell you how often I hear, I want to serve Latino students, but I need more money to do it. I need new money to do it. I'm not saying people don't need new money, but if the only way you can serve this population is with brand new money that is often uh, temporary, are you really going to be serving them? You just need it at that external grant to do it. Maybe you can start with that and then you institutionalize it, but I can't tell you how many times I hear excuses for what people uh, want of goodwill, a good intent, and zero impact. Don't give excuses. I mean, if you want to know what works, go into our Growing at Works database. We got over 150 of them. They're all evidence-based. I don't know that they would necessarily work for you well, what's authentic to you well, but don't let the excuses guide it. And then last, you know, I would say this, uh, you know, I, as I talk about race ethnicity, I do firmly believe what describes us doesn't divide us unless we let it. And that's really, really important. To say that I'm from Texas and I'm American doesn't mean I'm not one or the other, I'm both. To say I'm Latina and I'm Texan and I'm American doesn't mean I'm not whatever else that I choose to define myself. I'm a military brat, I'm so many other things. But it can be used as the very lever to divide us and say, you're serving, you're not serving, you're doing, you're not doing. Don't let that happen. Describing students does not divide us unless we let that happen. And that's important as you think about being intentional and being inclusive. Um, I want to thank you and applaud you for your efforts to work with your students every day. I did pull your data on enrollment, uh, persistence, and completion for the institutions I knew were going to be here, which I know I didn't catch all of them. I think there are lots of opportunities at your institutions to do more. And I hope you will take that charge and make sure the students that you are enrolling now and can enroll are served well by you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that and you've given us a lot to think about. 
And as we're thinking about this, we're going to kick off the conversation with uh, two of our discussants who've been asked to listen and respond to what they've had, what they've heard today. And then we're going to ask those of you in the audience to do the same. So I'm going to start off, let me just introduce, first of all, our two discussants. They are Michael Gutierrez of Eastfield College and Mayra Oliveres, uh, nope, don't say it, Urueto. Urueto? Yes. Okay, I, we, I practiced that. Okay. <laughs> I practiced that. I'm still not good at it. Urueta. Urueta. Uh, from Tarrant College. Um, so I'm not sure exactly which one of them is going to start. But they're going to just help us get our, our thoughts going on this and start the conversation, and then, then we'll all join in. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's give Ms. Santiago a hand for the presentation. As she talked about the difference between us enrolling and serving students, I kept on thinking, a lot about what we do at the college, and I'm sure you were doing the same thing too. And it, I started to reflect back to what Terry O'Banion was writing about in the early 70s regarding advising and how students, before they register, should really know what their vocation is. But do we do that at the colleges? We tend to be more enrollment factories, right? We're just trying to get our students in the classes, but the knowledge of, uh, of a career for these students, many times they don't have that. In fact, growing up in South San Antonio, I didn't know a lot about careers. I knew what a doctor was, I knew what a fireman was, I knew what a policeman was, but did I know what a mechatronics technician was? Heck, people in our college don't even know what a mechatronics technician is, and we have a program at Eastfield College. It is high school, yeah, yeah. But if you want to work at TI or Kraft, you become a uh, mechatronics technician. And it would have been very helpful for me to have some information about careers before I enrolled in college or chose my university that I wanted to go to. And so what we're trying to do at Eastfield is start the enrollment process, not with figuring out what classes you're going to take, but with a career inventory so that you can help determine for yourself what your goal is. Because Ms. Santiago talked a lot about what drives success. And you have to figure out what your goal is first so that you can have something to achieve to. So that's something that, that I thought about at first was the difference between serving and enrolling. And that's one way we can serve our students. Then the other thing that struck me that also deals with the serving and enrolling was enrolling, the changing profile of our students. All we need to do is go to our elementary schools and we'll know what our college is going to look like in about 13 years. And that profile is changing quickly, but when we look at our colleges and universities, the profile of our professional support staff our administrators or our faculty changing that quickly? It's not. It's not. One, people have to retire first, right? <laughs> but secondly, you know, we're trying to find professionals to fill some of our vacant positions, but we have a difficult time doing that. So if we're not serving our students appropriately, then the pipeline for our college and universities to look like our community is not going to be there if we don't serve them appropriately. So those are my observations for the discussion. So I'm going to hand it over to Maida. Well, thank you, Michael. First, I want to say um, thanks again for the research of Excelencia. I was excited when you started talking health professions because that's what my dissertation was on. And so I am especially thankful for the workforce, finding your workforce, Latinos in the health professions, because nobody else is looking at them nowhere anywhere, um, especially not the allied health programs. So we have nursing and we have uh, doctors, but there's 200 other health professions that nobody ever really thinks about until they need them, right, in the assisted living. So, so thank you for that. Um, and 
I'm going to start a little bit personal, too, in the sense that I didn't come, I started higher education at my profession um, at the University of Oklahoma, which is where I graduated from. No UT fans in here? Okay, great. Um, and so, and so it was very, I went into education like most of us do because we find that there's not a lot of us in education, and especially at those levels. Then I went to work at a humongous university medical center in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, whose name shall remain um, anonymous, and found that I was getting pulled into translations in clinics, but I was the student affairs director. And so what the heck was I doing translating in clinics, which is why I went and started a dissertation on graduates of allied health programs at the graduate level, um, because why aren't they here? And why won't anybody listen to me when I tell them we need scholarships for these students, right? And so I'm in the midst of this, working on my dissertation, and while I was very unhappy at my institution because nobody was seeing the urgency that I know Excelencia has seen and why it was started, um, I decided to go to the community college, and the sp specifically TCC um, in our campus, the Trinity River campus, is the health professions campus. So I was very intentional about getting myself there because I knew I would be talking to the students that would want to be in those graduate schools later. And so I went and infiltrated in the medical center so that I can come back and tell the students, here's what they want. Unfortunately, we don't fit a lot of the profile of what they want, but here's how you work to get there, right? And so thank you for that. Um, and as we, now in the community college, I've only been there, it'll be three years in January. Um, and my gosh, it is so hard um, to be at a place like that where where you are, you are open access, and it's wonderful to be open access, but the, the serving um, and the enrolling does fight with, they fight with each other all the time. Um, we have President Obama and his call to make community colleges free. I have students standing outside my office asking me for shoes and asking me for bus passes. So yeah, does, does that come with the free tuition? Um, I have students asking me for daycare. Um, we don't have daycare, and there's many legal reasons why we don't have a daycare on our specific campus, but there's just, you know, I think, um, again, and we at TCC, and I was glad to be mentioned, you know, we were one of the institutions that's doing well, we're often told we got to do more, um, and which is absolutely true. We have a for, about 44, 45% retention rate overall, or graduation rate, excuse me. And I hear pieces of us and part of the things that you're saying as far as the things that work, but we're doing the thing, but are we getting the students in the honors program, the cohort program? Um, so I think there's a lot of work for us to continue to do. Definitely um, agree with my colleague Michael in the sense that there's not a lot of us um, with the graduate degrees that are needed, so thank you, University of North Texas, for supporting me as I was going through um, my doctoral program. There's not a lot of us in the program, and there's um, not a lot of faculty at our institutions that looks like us and that, has, that is interested in the research that we're interested in. So it was wonderful to have Dr. Amy Fan tell me, you want to study access issues for Latino students? Great, let's do it. I've been working on this. So having, you know, having the parent orientations and having the ability to build community with my, my colleagues back there and up here um, so that we stay in. So the cohort program worked with us, right, at a graduate level. And so, so much of what you're saying resonates with the experiences, I think, of a lot of us in the room. But it's hard to be able to emulate that with the money, with 8,000 students that come through your campus that you have to see and advise, right, in twice a year, you, twice a semester sometimes, and so how do you marry all of that without more money? Thankfully, we're not in Arizona where they completely removed funding for community colleges and higher ed, but um, there's just a lot going through my head, and when we think work workforce, and when I think about, you know, I'm expecting another child, and my children are the ones in these K through 12 schools that we're talking about, and the reason why I didn't leave work um, two months after walking the stage and giving birth to my first child was because I want her to have teachers that don't look at her weird if she starts talking about going to see her abuelita in Mexico. I want people um, to not be pulled out of their offices that don't know anything about medicine to translate for my family. And so um, 
that's the reason why I'm in the community college, why I plan to stay in the community college, um, and why your work is so powerful, and why I thank you for being here. So I'll end with that. Thank you. Okay, so we... We thank both of you for, for getting us thinking about it and giving us a little bit more time to think about some of our questions that we might have or some of the comments that we would like to make about the presentation. So, um, hands, stand. We're going to bring the mic to you or you can come to us. We've got two of them going. I know that there are thoughts. There's a lot to think about in that presentation. If not, I'll just keep talking, you know. <laughs> Hello, and I have a cold, and you'll hear my accent too, so I'm sorry for that first. Um, when it's it okay, I'm way up here, so I can't get any of that cootie. No cooties over here. <laughs> when it comes to recruitment and knowing that we're passionate about student success, who do you um, spend the most time with? Um, the parents, um, for the students to have the support at home, or the students, because they're the ones going through education. So, uh, you know, thank you. Uh, I think that the dance here is, and that's why I think reframing is so important, uh, that you have to choose between one or the other is a challenge. Why aren't you concurrently working with the parents and the student? Why does it have to be either the parent or the student? I mean, in some cases, the parent will be more interested than the student. Sometimes the student will be more interested than the parent. Um, but I think, you know, because of constraints, you've got to focus on those that, are, that want your time and attention the most. Um, but I would say think outside the box. I know that some places have parent orientation that's part of it. Some of them require parents and make it optional. Try to do both. Um, and that, I'm not trying to work around your question, but I am a policy person. Um, but I would push you to think about that. And then if I had to choose, because I believe in answering questions that are asked of me, um, I would focus on the student. I think the parent can be a powerful ally and help. They're the reason many of them are doing it. But uh, talking to a parent, not the student, doesn't get it done. I think the student has to, if I have to choose, I start there. Thank you so much for, for you know, all the, that you brought today, especially of the data. And I remember reading the Excellency report and having that same kind of jaw-dropping feeling of, what? How did this happen? Um, and, and, you know, having, we've, we've, all, we've all looked at the situation and we wonder, you know, okay, why isn't it working? I mean, all the resources, all the money, all the good intentions. I mean, I don't think there's anybody, there's no Svengali, there's no person sitting in Washington or uh, in, the, in the chancellor's office of a particular college that's going, aha, let's see how I can mess with students today. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and yet we have these systemic issues that don't seem to change. And, and so my, my focus has really always been on the mythologies that jive, you know, the, these differences and the beliefs that there are certain kinds of students. And you have, you know, you, you slice and dice and figure out where they are. And then you, you so you never really challenge the, the, the mythologies behind the design. Why do we even have registration the way that we do it? Why do we have outreach the way that we do it? These are things where we're saying, okay, we only pay attention to it when it feels like it's broken, instead of always kind of mulling through it and saying, okay, what values are inherent in how we do operations? And so that's you know, been the challenge that I've been talking about with our folks, is to really reflect on and get into those designs because we're getting the results that the designs are built for. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not liking the results, we have to go back to the designs. We can't just change a thing here or there. That's why Title V funding has had such stru struggles, is because it's been additional funding that never gets institutionalized because no one knows what an institutionalized thing looks like. Right? And so then all of these things kind of point to, so the data gives us you know, and, and usually they're like these little pressure points, and, and most people feel uncomfortable. It's like, oh, well, wait, you know, and we care about all our students and everything. But, but in fact, if you look, if you look just, just at the data and the overall graduation rates, I mean, you know, higher education is under fire for quality, 
It's under fire for completion. It's under fire for everything. When you have statistics that say 83% uh, of provosts at colleges and universities say they prepare people for a job, 14% of employers say the same thing. That's right. right? Yeah. And so those disconnects have manifested themselves in multiple ways. And I'm curious, you know, the policy questions. Mm -hmm. You know, we got some high profile candidates, one was on the wall, uh, you know, saying free community college and this is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna, you know, get the states involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, the states are pulling back. Absolutely. So, you know, we're gonna get the states involved, supposedly. Um, if, you could, if you could say three policy planks mm -hmm. that would make a difference and change some of the mythologies, what would be those three? Now, that's not three things. Change, make a difference and change the mythology. That's, that's all right there. But I'll, uh, I did say I try to answer questions. Let me just say this too. Uh, you know, our students live in an uncomfortable space every day. Why should we live in anything less than an uncomfortable space? I appreciate the comment for that reason. You know, I'm uncomfortable every day. I mean, like, I know who I am. I don't have to, but <laughs> I'm talking on behalf of other people. Um, and it's uncomfortable. So I think the, the uh, mythology that you can be comfortable in your job should be uh, a high alert that you're not doing it right. That's my opinion on that. But to your question, um, three possible. And I will say this, you know, uh, this is not, uh, this is not, I didn't know she was going to put that up there, but we're not endorsing any candidates. This was her time as a first lady, um, and that was way back in the day. And uh, that was even before she announced she agreed to do that. So, but having said that, it's nice. So, uh, but um, we're a nonprofit, so we're not partisan in that regard. Three policy planks that would make a difference. I would say um, we have to invest more in retention than we are doing right now. This focus on access without completion is a big challenge. I think retention has to be have more of a policy focus, and it has to be evidence-based. So I would say, let's look at replicating or scaling the things we know work with evidence in retention. Um, I think, uh, so that's one I would definitely uh, say, and I think there are ways to do that that we're not really considering. Um, and I had a second one that just blanked on temporarily, but it will come back to me. Uh, I think another area that we uh, are focusing on, not focusing enough on, is the issue of quality. Again, you know, the Higher Education Act was focused on providing access. It was like, you know, we get them in and que vayan con Dios, we got you in, it's up to you to get through. Um, the reality is that, so there's a retention co the component there, but there's also the quality, it's access to quality. It's not just access for its own sake. And we are learning more and more about learning outcomes and what's possible. There's lots of imperfect strategies and approaches, but quality, there are good organizations, AAC and you and others, are really trying to find ways to get better sense of that. And I believe access to quality has to be a policy priority. Well, and, and you know, the, the question that, that I usually bandy about with the, the access thing is that, you know, really the money thing is not a big issue with Title IV funding and other things. I mean, there are opportunities to get in. You know, certainly the living expenses, that usually kills it for a lot of folks. And 70% of the reasons why people drop out or stop out has nothing to do with the classroom. And that's another important statistic. But, you know, when we think about access as, do I belong? I mean, I think that's still something we haven't dealt with, in, you know, when students, especially students that come to community colleges, have that feeling of, well, I'm not sure I belong, I know I need an opportunity, I know I need a better life, I don't know if I belong, and then that first experience at the door, right, if it's an inviting experience and they feel like they can belong, then that, I think that's the definition of quality, you know, because we, we can get trapped, and faculty get trapped on this a lot, you know, rigor is quality. And so then restricting people from certain experiences because they're not college ready, they, I don't think mo many people understand that that's also saying, you know, you don't belong. Right, that's the inverse. That's constraining access uh, to have ipso facto quality. That's the, that's the inverse, right? So uh, I'll just make, increase my standards and therefore they're going to more likely to graduate. You haven't done a damn thing in your institution to make a difference. Excuse me, I didn't mean to say that word. Uh, you didn't do anything differently in your institution. You just changed the student that walked in your door. Right. That's not value added. Right. And That's that selectivity to the nth degree. And then I just want to say the third thing that, um, because you asked it of me, so I get you the quality. And I do think, I do think this, we have to crack the nut. So I think we need to invest in innovation that addresses issues of 
quality information and advising to our students. And I believe in public policy we can do that. We can incentivize innovation. How can we have, I mean, if you have something like Netflix and Amazon, you know, you take one movie and all of a sudden, if you like that, you might like X and Y and Z. Why don't we have that for our students who are looking for vocations? Like, if you like taking care of your siblings, maybe you'll like, you know, child care services or early childhood or, or development. You know, why don't we do that? We, if we can do that with Netflix, why the heck can't we do that with our students in a way that maybe is more automated? It doesn't give them the answer, but things they never thought of as criteria. Got to think outside the box and be uncomfortable in it. Maybe that's kind of, maybe not the best thing, but that's what I would say. Um, first of all, thank you for the work that you do to support our students. Um, and I realize that I'm probably not the intended audience for today. I'm in K-12. Um, but what I was really hoping to learn by coming here today was what can we do in K-12 to help our Latino students successfully transition to community colleges? Um, I think it's a great question. And I, I'm sorry if you felt like I wasn't really speaking to you because I think that you can, in some ways, you can replace a community college with K-12 because you have a lot of the same issues in terms of resources and availability and time. Um, if I had to say one thing, I would say uh, don't abandon the student at the when they cross the stage at high school graduation. I, so for me, it would be, you know, help track that student, align with them, belong with them. If they're going to UNC or they're going to Tarrant County, they're still your graduate, and you should be vested. Use National Clearinghouse Student Tracker. Did your graduates do well in college? Did they drop out after the first semester of the first year, whatever? Own that student, and if they didn't do well, is that better information of what you need to know about preparing them well. I don't often see that because, you know, we're so busy pointing fingers that K-12 didn't do it right, higher ed isn't doing it right. They created the teachers that educated them in K-12 and they didn't do it right. Um, I believe strongly we just, we need to all take our part. K-12 is essential. Um, I don't believe in blaming others, but if we can create an environment where we're owning our students that were with us K-12 and go elsewhere, it creates this, this powerful feeder loop. And I've seen that happen to teachers and to others. So I would say that's one, maybe that's too amorphous, and if so, I apologize. But um, I see students, when they see that caring adult, somebody who pays attention to where they were in their success, if they're not abandoned at one point and then starting fresh with another, it can make a big difference. Um, the other is I think, um, I think we need to do more to support our, our teachers and such in K-12 because the, I don't believe we're providing the cultural competency and readiness that they deserve and that I think many of them want to be able to serve their Latino students well. I don't think you only have to be Latino to serve Latinos. I think that's not the right way. I mean, we'd love to see more of them because they're less than 7% of the teaching workforce, but you know, a caring adult trumps that every time. Um, so, but they need the support I'm, I'm in colleges of education where I, you know, so much focus is on pedagogy and academic rigor and zero focus on cultural competency. And these teachers go into classrooms unprepared for what they face. They don't have time to even teach the discipline that they are br brought into. They're doing case management and they're doing, you know, 101, just trying to keep the kid uh, from any harm or due diligence. They're not even able to teach. So I would say, um, and then the third thing I would say is that uh, we need to make sure that K-12 gets the kind of administrators that can support their teachers. And that means that, you know, don't, we don't want people to become administrators because that's the only way you're going to get a pay increase. Um, that we are paying attention to uh, how they can be the coaches and the advocates and supporters of their teachers so the teachers have the support they need to in turn serve their students. And I don't see that infrastructure. So I don't know if that's too general, I didn't go into disciplinary things, but I do think when I look at it, I, I tend to look from an institutional and from a systemic approach, and those are things I think can support. We have such great teachers that don't stay because they don't have the infrastructure. We have great students who don't stay because they don't have a good infrastructure. So let's build the infrastructure. Let's make sure they're there. That is within our capacity to do, and we're not doing it, in my opinion. Hello? Okay. Uh, so on the ride over here, so I, we rode together, but you were talking about... You were my chauffeur. Yes, I was. Um, so I was wondering if you could share again with the audience, because I thought it was really cool while we were driving and you shared it, 
um, what it means to serve. So we talked about um, HSIs, and you mentioned some of the statistics here, uh, but yeah. the difference between enrolling and serving, and you gave these examples of how you would measure it, and so I was wondering if you could share those things again. Sure. Um, and, you know, just full disclosure, I've been looking at HSIs for 20 years. That's how long they've been funded. Uh, so it shows my age, right? I was in the Department of Ed at the time. Um, so I said, you know, the distinction for me, and it's different every time I hear it, but for me, to distinguish what it means to serve means you're enrolling, and I think I said this, but if not, I mean, you're enrolling them, you're retaining them. We can measure these two things, by the way. They're retaining them. You're supporting them, which means you have evidence-based practices. You are financing them. We know how many are getting aid, right? And you are graduating them. To me, that's what it means to serve. And I, can, I have a metric for every single one of those components of serving. Now, uh, I couple that because while I'm a data nerd, data are only as good as they're used. And if you don't understand context, you can misinterpret data. Um, I would couple that with much more qualitative stuff and say, I want to go deeper and say, what are you doing in your evidence-based practices? How do I know you're intentionally serving them? So we're coming up with this idea. Crazy, I know, but you know, we're all about out of the box of being uncomfortable. What if you created a seal of approval, kind of a seal of excellence here we're, we're considering. It says, you know, I want to show that you're serving, not just enrolling Latinos. So do you have metrics that show positive momentum in those categories, in enrolling, retaining, supporting, financing, and graduating Latino students? Are you tracking it for three or four years? Can you show me that? And do you have several programs that are intentionally serving Latinos, not to the exclusion of others, but you can show me you've disaggregated your data Amongst those you're serving, Latinos are doing as well as or better than others. Because that, to me, is a serving institution. And you can, you can substitute Latino for urban versus rural, male versus female, African American versus all. I mean, it's a, it's a structure, it's a model that works beyond that. But I, to me, that's what it means to serve. And I have to admit, for me, I've got to show it, I've got to prove it. And I have lots of wonderful examples of programs that people tell me all the day are making a difference. And they just give me testimonials, student testimonials, surveys. And I say, that's wonderful, but the aggregate of testimonials are not data. And that's not to insult the testimonials, it's to say, in the language for uh, leverage and support and replicability and scalability, you need to have something you can get your hands around. You need some data, something that's quantifiable. And it doesn't have to be rocket science. It's pre-post tests, that's not complicated. It's a way, quick way to show value added. You don't have to be a, a rigorous evaluator or pay a million dollars for that. You know, you could show those who were able to participate versus those that weren't, that kind of stuff. Pushing ourselves to think about making the case so that we're not thrown out of the water or say that's a nice idea, but yeah, it's just because you care, but that isn't gonna hold water. The onus is on us to prove it. Is that, is that what I said? I hope so. <laughs> It sounded good this time. I don't know if I said that in the car. Hi. Um, going back to what you were saying about K-12, I feel like it is a very big thing that we have to actually go back and kind of really be strong with our high school. Because coming from someone who is a student, who actually dealt with actually being ridiculed at the high school level, where I was told I was sat down by all my principals and teachers and told I wasn't going to go to college. I wasn't going to be something. But it took one person, like you were saying, it took one individual, and it was a great teacher of mine who told me, you know what, Dylan, you are brilliant. You can make it happen. You just got to actually push for it. Give it a shot. What's the worst that could happen? You already told you weren't going to be anything. Why not give it a shot? What's the worst that could happen? And I did give it a shot. It turned out that I actually had really good strengths and ended up tutoring kids in math and science and turning out going back from the kid who was told I wasn't going to be anything, missing a lot of school because of that, to thinking that, no, I'm not going to be anything. Because I am a first generation. My parents didn't go to college. I'm the only one in my, my family to go to college. So it's kind of a big deal that when I was told that, I was already thinking, all right, I'm obviously just a statistic. I'm just going to be just like my dad. Yeah. And being told that really does hurt someone. But at the same time, being brought back and actually told, hey, and like what you were saying, I was not never told any jobs. Michael brought up a very great point. I didn't know many jobs. There was like the firemen, the policemen, your local block parties. You were kind of introduced to stuff like that. But at the same time, I wasn't really thought of, like, because I didn't have a dad. So I didn't really know of that male figure of what could actually be a job, what could be a career, and being opportunities. I didn't know how to get scholarships. It took me to get into my sophomore year of college. I paid my first year of college all out on my own. 
and had to learn from there. Wow. So I'm just trying to figure out, on these uh, scholarships giving out to Latinos, how are you going to give them out and not feel bias of interest of saying, we're just giving it to them for Latinos, not just because they're, they're not needing it. And I want to actually figure that out. What, what are you going to go across on that? So you, there was a lot in there. Um, no, 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 no. I don't mean that in a bad way. Congratulations for not letting the haters hate, um, for, for uh, persevering. I think a lot of that, what we see success is despite us and despite the system and despite the institution, not because of it. And that's what I think we need to change. They be, should be successful because of us, not despite us. And I think that, to me, is a real motivational uh, mantra that I think about all the time in working with and highlighting those that are doing good work. Um, so I'm glad and I hope you'll keep going and you can be some of that motivation for others uh, that you didn't get. And that's the other thing, you know, I'm a person of privilege, we all are here, we have a college education, that's a person of privilege. If you're Latino, only 22% of us have an associate degree or higher. Even if you're not, all adults, only 38%, we are people of privilege, a third, only a third of us in this country have an associate degree or higher. We have a responsibility, I believe, as people of privilege to give back and share with others, even if we didn't get it, we did it despite that. So that's, sorry, that's just my moral compass on that kind of stuff. To your point about scholarships, um, you know, uh, I do believe having scholarships based on something other than a single characteristic is important. So uh, I don't know if I said anything that gave that impression, but I would say, you know, uh, a lot of federal aid and most aid that I think has a great value in making a difference for our social mobility is predicated on need. So uh, need matters. We are seeing a challenge in some states where the focus is more on merit, uh, regardless of need. And I think that, uh, you know, not that merit doesn't deserve some support, but uh, the reality is that if I have uh, a quarter left, I'm going to invest in the person I think can uh, maximize it the most, uh, or that needs it the most to change our life and have value added than I am somebody who has merit and maybe has the infrastructure that can pay for it but doesn't want to. So I think uh, being uh, need-based is essential for scholarships. Uh, we do work with the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. They are overtly targeting Latino students. It's private scholarships. And in private scholarships, you can uh, give it to somebody's cat if you want. It's up to you how you set the criteria. The Hispanic Scholarship Fund has a very high merit and need-based criteria. Um, and even then, they don't have enough money for the students who are eligible and ready for it. Uh, but again, to my point, I don't, uh, I don't think you just give money just because, well, here, you're Hispanic, take some money. I don't think it's that. Uh, you want to, as I said, you work with people ready to work with you. If you find a young person who has every capacity and capability and needs that shot, finding a way to get them the resources to do it, that's my responsibility because I'm a knowledgeable, caring adult, and I've got to make sure they get it. Hear me? Yeah, all right. Okay, hello, my name is Osvaldo Garduno. I'm from uh, Kilgore College. I'm an international student. I was born in Mexico. So when I moved here to the United States, uh, I went to Kilgore College because it was one of the cheapest colleges that accepted me. So I was like, well, let's go ahead, right? <laughs> but um, Very pragmatic. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, as a Mexican, you know, like, I know a lot of um, undocumented people, uh, undocumented students who actually, they are on high school. They are like, um, they're a student on high school, but they don't know they can even go to college. That is one point that uh, I, make a, I make a meeting on my, on my community, I make a meeting. They didn't know the people that they can go to college, yeah. they can apply for TAXFA. Even if they don't can apply for FAFSA, they also can apply for TAXFA. It's not much money, but they get something, right? Right. And um, one thing that I noticed is like the, the first thing, like the first um, people that you had to uh, talk with is uh, to make the people go to college, to the students go to college, is with the parents. Because the parents, they are the, like, like the 90%, of, I mean, not, not the 90%, like the 50% of the time, the students are with the parents. In, that's a good, like, a lot of time. They spend a lot of time with the parents. And the parents is, like, the biggest support for the student. So the first thing, the first person that you had to talk with the, uh, for the students to go to college is with the parents. And after that, I think like when you're in high school, around 11 or 12 grade, you, had, you do have to talk with a student because the student is the one that you have um, 
he has to have he has to be motivated to go to college. He has to know that he even if he is like in document, even if um, he feels like he doesn't he can get a job or anything because of social security number, they still can go to college and they can apply for a lot of college. It is right. like 15 states that accept undocumented students, and um, that's one of the um, one of the informations that I show um, share on my uh, on the meeting that I organized. Yeah. Um, Many who was one of the persons who was there for help me, mm -hmm. on, like um, Kilo College. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, we also talked with another person, um, Jennifer Bailey. She's another person who uh, also helped us to organize all this uh, program to learn all the people, and many of the students, of the first generation of the students of the uh, Mexican people, or the Latino people, they don't know they can go to college. Right. So I think the people should focus more, more on like high school or just before college, because if they don't know they can go, it's like, there is no point. So thank you, I, I, you know, uh, I was just at a meeting at National Urban League um, three days ago, two days ago? before I came here in DC, uh, so two days ago, I guess. Um, and we weren't talking about documented, but I think your point is very salient, and that is at what point do we get information to, to people? Documented, undocumented, I mean, you know, uh, citizens or not. So, I, and I have a special uh, interest in, in, in the responding to the issue of undocumented for sure, but I will say this, you know, my comment to them was, why don't we give information to parents at the maternity ward? right when they get the information about how to apply for social security numbers and all that stuff for your kids, why wouldn't we have something in there about how to prepare and how to pay for college? When are things most possible than when a child is first born? And then you give it, you give it early, and that's about pretty early, but then it's, it's also often, because I do think it, it doesn't permeate our educational culture. It doesn't it permeate in ways that it could. Uh, and then you get a lot of bad information out there and you hear that we can't afford it, it's too expensive. You hear every year when school starts about the loan debts, people with $150,000 in loans, or it now costs $50,000 to go to Baylor, or, you know, and that's more than a family makes. So in some ways we are uh, creating uh, the antithesis of attention by sharing those stories that are great and sensational, but I can tell you the majority of students aren't paying $150,000 in debt. Um, so I, do, I, I don't disagree. I think it should be a message all the way across, and we have a responsibility to do that. When it comes to undocumented students, I think that the challenge is multifold. It's, it's a complex uh, group that we have students who've been raised here who, don't, who find out later and who speak English and know the system, and Plessy B. Ferguson um, are guaranteed a quality K-12 education. Um, and looking at what resources are available and what the pathways are is what makes it possible for them. So to your point, congratulations, and I, I am very appreciative that you do these kinds of things. There are others in the state, there are others in communities that are trying to do this kind of work. At the national level, um, there are groups, United We Dream and others, that are pushing DACA uh, for students who are here and can apply for them. Um, and that's an opportunity where you can be eligible for some aid if you can approved status with DACA. Um, and then I'm on the advisory board of a group called the Dream.us, where we're partnering with two-year and four-year institutions uh, to fully fund dreamers with the commitment from the institutions that they will, that student can get that degree with $25,000, all provided by the Dream.us, uh, but that they commit to that student, helping them the first two years at the community college and the next two years at the four-year in order for them to complete in a timely manner. And it's a relatively new construct, and they raised over $80 million to try and do that because it, people didn't want to wait anymore for us to pass immigration reform and the rights of these students. Uh, they're not everywhere. It's a kind of a drop in the bucket. We've seen change. Hispanic Scholarship Fund previously didn't give to undocumented students. They do now. Mald FS scholarships. Um, we had collected at one point a whole bunch of scholarships, mainly private, where students could apply, but we didn't want to make those scholarships vulnerable because they just didn't ask citizenship. It's not that they were necessarily targeting undocumented students, but we knew if we put them on our website that people would target them to try and put pressure for them to transition, and we didn't want to do that. So uh, thank you for the work that you do. I think if we can multiply that, that's something that works, we should do that. And uh, being sensitive to that is summarily important. And the last thing I would say is what I would I hate in conversations time and again 
is if the assumption is that you're Hispanic, therefore you're undocumented, becomes the corollary there. Being sure we're supporting our undocumented students coming from a position of power because we are U.S. born and we vote so that our undocumented uh, brothers and sisters get support is something we have to be clear about, but you don't want it to hijack the Latino uh, focus of where it is because we have lots of undocumented students that are from other backgrounds and we can use that politically so that it's not just seen as a Latino issue, but it's an issue that gets others because I, I I'm enough of a crass policy person, I said, you know, if we put the face of a Russian kid or an Irish kid as the face of the undocumented student, I think we would pass immigration reform. Because the people who elect, that's what they recognize, that's what they identify with. They don't identify with us, we're them. And so I, not to denigrate any undocumented student, but if I have to be crass and say, put that face, that'll make a difference, then that's what I want to do. And, uh, you know, sometimes you got to you know, uh, lose a little bit of uh, the battle to win the war. But that kind of thinking is a big scale beyond what you're saying. I hope that what you've done, uh, you've got in some way in a curriculum or structure that other people can uh, replicate it. And if others are interested, I hope you'll follow up with him. If I can give you information at the national level, I'm happy to do it. Can I make one comment before we do this? Um, no one asked me about uh, the other workforce part, so I'm gonna, because then I'll speak to you. But the, when I saw 75% of Latinos earning a certificate of associate degree in a given year where in health fields were at certificate associate level, I kept thinking, what if we could do some scaffolding? What if as institutions, I can go out and get that home health care aide that got that certificate, who showed vested interest and ability enough to get the certificate to become a phlebotomist, to get an associate degree, and go from making 19,000 to 24, 25,000. And what if I provided scaffolding as an institution, you know, th through transfer, articulation, whatever, to get that phlebotomist to then get uh, a BA in nursing? Or is it CNA, you know, the, the precursor to that, a nurse aide to then become a nurse? What if we created a structure like that, rather than leaving it to the individual who has to get back into the workforce quickly to do it? Wouldn't that be a contribution by the institution to the workforce, to those that have already shown a level of interest and commitment in a significant way and benefit our community? Why don't we think about things like that? They're there, we gotta go get them where they are, rather than saying, well, they're not here in this BA program, so too bad. Let's go recruit in Philippines and let's go to Spain and, and get them there. Okay, sorry, but that's my high horse. But, you know, there's so many, when you look at the data, there's so many solutions if we're willing to think outside the box. I hope you all do that. Clearly, Deborah has given us a lot to, to think about today. And I want to challenge you to don't let this be the end of the conversation. I want everybody to go back to your campuses and continue these conversations and tell people what you heard today. Tell them about some of the things that inspired you today. Tell them about, about uh, the conversations that we've had here today so that her visit is a spark for us on our campuses. And we appreciate that. And don't sit down because I have something for you too. <laughs> oh, it's presents. We have a lot of people to thank, and we, first of all, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your days to be here with us. And so we thank you for participating on behalf of the Bill J. Priest Center. I also have a number of people that helped put this together, and I would be remiss if I did not thank my staff members that helped me with that. Not only the people who were on the stage who were, who were there to uh, share their ideas and their thoughts with you, but also my staff. So Amanda, my GA, Amanda Jackson. <laughs> And my assistant, the lovely Sue Young. <laughs> Believe me, this really, really could not have happened without them, and so I thank them very much. But most of all, we want to thank Deborah for taking time out of her very busy schedule to be here, and so we have a little gift for her. Something to remember us by. And, <laughs> and make sure to come back again. We're going to invite you back again. And we're, and when, we, when she comes back, we're going to have results from today's conversation to share with her, right? I will love that. <laughs> I, I will come back to that. I will come back to that. Do I open it now or do I? Oh, you can, sure. Is this she didn't have enough luggage in her, you know, to carry on the plane with her? We thought we'd give her a little something extra and heavy. Oh, this has to be. Yeah, this has to be. <laughs>
nothing embarrassing looking. <laughs> No, no, not, not embarrassing. Again, I want to thank everyone for being here today. I want to wish you safe and safe and quick, hopefully, journeys back to you home or to work or wherever you're going this afternoon. And know that we very much appreciate you being here. So without further ado, let's just show that it's like, yeah, a little bling. <laughs> a little bling. <laughs> And, and again, thanks to all of you. Safe journeys. We appreciate you. And look forward. We've had this up here. Hopefully some of you will look at this information. The Council for the Study of Community Colleges in the spring having their conference right here in Plano. And look for us again next fall for the next Bill J. Priest Center Don A. Buholtz lecture. Thank you. <laughs>